as our projects begin. By Steve Becko, March 24, 2012 Various spokespeople for the Galactic Federation are telling is that our time to serve is either here or will arrive soon. 1. Salusa, representing the Galactic Federation had this to say on the subject on March 9, 2012. It is as you might say a time when it is all hands on deck. As you enter the period when changes will take place in rapid succession. For many reasons, those who are light workers will be called upon to involve themselves in many tasks that they have prepared for over many lives. 2. The Galactic Federation through Greg Giles said much the same on March 15th. We will recruit as many of you as needed to assist in these great tasks. And your training sessions will also move ahead at a brisk pace. This is why we ask you to remain sharp and remain focused. It will be soon that you will be called upon in service and you will be expected to bring your best with you and reach your greatest potential as a member of the Galactic Federation of Light. 3. The GF through Blossom essentially agreed on March 19. Before you came to this planet, before you even moved into the human status, you agreed to assist in this very time you are in now, to change the state of the situation. Each of you, then Massey, understood what would need to be done at the appointed time. Each one of you will recall your position when it is necessary. Of course there will be many who are not light workers, but light holders, and for them these messages may not apply. Both roles are important. The light worker feels a desire to serve. The light holder feels a desire to potentiate, actualize, or realize. My understanding is that people will know who has chosen which path. If the call to serve doesn't resonate with you, by all means pass it by. Each of us must follow the path of his or her own dharma, so I speak at the moment only to light workers. Blog sites are multiplying, as we light workers get the word out. Radio shows are opening. Videos are being produced. I haven't heard of any TV shows since Alfred Webra began his, but those to may commence at some point, as may meet UPS, lectures, and conferences. There may not be time for movies except perhaps like Thrive. But what I wanted to discuss here are some things to expect and consider as we begin our projects. The first thing I wanted to mention is that teams and groups may find their projects going through stages or phases. And the three most important phases to consider at this point are 1 the honeymoon, 2. The tug of war, and 3. The coalescence. In the honeymoon, the team has just committed itself and marvels at the prospect of cooperation before them. All seems possible. The future looks bright. The team begins as a marriage might with the highest expectations of smooth sailing and a successful partnership and conclusion. And then harsh reality may set in in the tug of war phase. Here, the first disagreements occur and people realize that they may indeed have different means and ends. People may be committed to their own vision of the project and others may be equally committed to theirs the two of them being perhaps different, perhaps divergent. Shock may arise as people realize that all may not be smooth sailing. People may begin to resort to their winning ways, bargaining, posturing, push and pull, and all the other moves that people use to try to get their way. 
if increasing resistance is met, people may begin to share amongst each other, gossiping and complaining about others, in an effort to gain a sympathetic ear or even allies. Groups start polarizing and may even fall apart at this stage. Many groups don't reach the coalescence stage. Many wonderful projects founder here and leave no trace. A good idea. A flash in the pan. An idea before its time. At this stage, it's necessary to stop the gossiping inside bar discussions. Sidebars bleed the energy off and may forestall or even prevent resolution. Stopping them calls for commitment on one's own part not to gossip and not to collude with others who wish to. It takes resolve to funnel the disagreements back into the group where they can be addressed and completed. And once they're funneled back in, then the group itself, or mediators within the group, need to assist those having disagreements to see their way through. And that's where the two most important tools that promote coalescence come into play. The two most nurturing, practical and empowering tools any group has to get itself through the tug of war phase and into a coalescence are sharing and listening. What is sharing? Sharing is a form of communication in which an individual reveals him or herself. I don't mean sharing as in share and share alike. I mean it rather as in telling another who we are in the matter under discussion. There again however, I don't mean ear as in telling another what we like and don't like or talking to get strokes or be affirmed. I mean it as in sharing what is basic for us, essential, the ground we stand on, our principles, our commitments, and, equally important, our feelings. Sharing means openness, transparency, vulnerability. Many people feel acute discomfort around sharing how they truthfully feel. Those who do often experience connection and immense relief. Those who don't often experience increasing isolation and stress. What we refuse to share owns us and runs us so sharing these things can release us and reconnect us with the group. Most often what we don't disclose to another, and what constitutes the missing piece for them, is how we feel how something sits with us, how it impacts us, how it resonates with us is what is lacking in most other people's knowledge of us and is the piece which, known, allows them, and in fact attracts them, to relate to us from a position of comfort and compassion. If we favor withholding we usually do so because we are up against our history of having been hurt by others, disappointed, rejected, abandoned, etc. But without sharing how we feel, people may feel they don't know us and need to guard themselves against us. They may be suspicious of those who won't disclose. What is it about sharing that heals, attracts? and nourishes. The most important aspect of it for me is that sharing communicates the truth, responsibly and harmlessly. The truth heals. The truth is what all of us, all life forms, seek. We are here on this earth to know the truth about ourselves. The very purpose of life is to discover our true identity and that true identity it turns out, is God. When one of us discovers the truth about ourselves in a moment of enlightenment, God meets God. That is the moment for which all of life was created. The way God designed life, to the best of my knowledge, is that deception binds but truth sets us free. The more lies we tell, 
the more our stress increases and our awareness decreases. The more truth we share, the more our stress decreases and our awareness increases. Or so it seems. Sharing is the great leveler, the great equalizer. All shares are born equal. The millionaire's share is as valid as the pauper's share. How many times have I seen a person cop to the fact that, though all other circumstances in their life may be unequal, the share of one is precisely equal no more, no less to the share of another. Perhaps one has to participate in a group to really see this. It becomes instantly visible the minute the people in a group begin to share and they usually don't begin to share right away. The share is verifiable only by me. No one else knows what is true for me and I know only by watching my release or submitting my share to my inner voice. If I'm telling the truth, I'll be set free from tension and resistance. If I'm not telling the truth, tension and resistance will grow. In this sense, sharing the truth is foolproof. I can't tell whether I shared the truth by seeing whether I feel increasing or decreasing relief. No release. I have not shared the truth. Time to try again. Time to see what I'm withholding and share that. Increasing relief. Good. I'm on the right track. One cannot fool the inner voice. One cannot fool the divine plan. Events in life have been arranged such that the truth will set us free and only the truth. Money will not. Beauty will not. Power will not. Only the truth brings release. As far as I'm concerned, that's the way God designed it. Such an explanation may not satisfy some people, but I still regard it as true.